14 years ago, MPPs unanimously passed a landmark piece of legislation. The Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act put us on a two-decade-long path to make our province a much more barrier-free place for the more than 2.6 million of us with disabilities. The latest report on how well we're doing to meet those goals is now out, and the verdict is not good. In fact, the report's author says the promised accessible Ontario is, quote, nowhere in sight, and that the vision in the act has, by and large, turned out to be a mirage. How can we get back on track? Well, let's ask. David Onley, he's Ontario's former Lieutenant Governor and the author of the just released review. And Yvonne Felix is here. She's the National Lead for Technology and Innovation at the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, the CNIB. Good to see you two back here in our studio. Thank you. Good to see you too. Uh, okay, you're on, do I still call you Your Honor, even though you're you not the LG anymore? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's do that. Uh, here's what you say in your report. The overwhelming emotions expressed at our hearings, which you held, were both anger and profound frustration. How come? Because people felt, back in 2005, when the act was passed, that there was, this meant that real change was coming, and it was going to be coming fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. I recall quite vividly uh, in our first meetings with the Minister's Advisory Council. Um, Sandra Pupatello at the time was the minister, that we all just thought, oh, 20 years, yeah, uh, we'll have it, have it done way before that. 10 years, maybe seven, if we really buckle down. That was the perception. And a great deal of enthusiasm on the part of um, people that we just would be meeting and talking with from the disability community that finally prescriptive legislation was being put into place with timetables and deadlines and that of course was the um, big complaint about the original act passed by the Harris government, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act, easier to say, but uh, it had no um, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act has always been a little bit clunky, but, um, but of course it, it didn't have the prescriptive legislation, the ODA, originally. Mm. So, Well, you have some pretty strong language in your report, and I want to read just one phrase here, because you compared services that disabled people now cannot access mm -hmm. to the water fountains or the restaurants that African Americans were mm. prohibited from using in the Deep South because of what was effectively apartheid yep. in the Deep South 50 years ago. That is a tough comparison. Why do you feel it's apt? Because it's deliberate. Not deliberate to discriminate, but it's, uh, it's deliberately placed on the basis of perception of aesthetic design as opposed to meeting the needs of some 20% of the population, inching closer to 20% of the population. Uh, there's a small little restaurant right near these studios that I encountered a couple of years ago when I attended the book launch of a friend of mine. And so we wanted to go to this restaurant and I said, well, I'm pretty sure I know where it is, so let's go there. And we got there and the first thing I saw as we approached the door was that there was a, an automatic door opener button with the, the blue wheelchair symbol on it. So I thought, oh good, there's an automatic door. Before you could get through the door, you had to go up a step. Mm. Hmm. So what was the point of the door? Um, you know, for a person like myself using an electric scooter or somebody using a wheelchair, um, the button was, was just useless. Hmm. So now, I, you know, on certain conditions, I can get up a step or two, and the friends I, were with, I was with said, well, we'll just lift the scooter in if you can navigate this step. So we did, and then we went. There was a washroom inside, and I thought, well, I'm just going to make use of this. It had a wheelchair symbol uh, outside of it. And they'd spent a lot of money renovating this washroom so that it was fully accessible. Lots of room, not just for a tiny little scooter like mine, but a, if someone came in with a big power chair, if they could have gotten up that step, there was more than enough room. Hmm. Um, but I thought, so, okay, you've spent the money on renovating a washroom. You've spent the money on putting a power door at the front, but there's a step. Uh, can't get into the place. Can't get into the place. Hmm. And so the reality is that um, a lot of the changes that have been made because of the AODA have been made with people who have good intentions but really truly don't know what it is that they're hmm. doing. 
or what, what is needed to be done. Yvonne, as I get you into this conversation here, you've been here a couple times before, but on the, mm -hmm. on the chance that people didn't see those programs, uh, you should just take a moment here to explain the visor that you're wearing right now and what it helps you do. Sure, so I'm wearing something called eSight. Uh, it's a head-mounted display that actually allows me to access my remaining functional vision. So this is something that was not available a few years ago, but it's uh, available now, and there are other devices just like this that are for partial sight as opposed to uh, sight substitution. This is sight enhancement. Gotcha. I want to pluck another line out of David Onley's report and get you to react to it, okay? Because mm -hmm. he says, much of the built environment in Ontario today is hostile towards people with disabilities. Mm. And I wonder if you feel that in your everyday life. <sighs> I do. I do. How so? Well, I can tell you right now that from what I see in my professional life, Accessibility is not considered as part of the development. It's not part mm. of the plans. People should be aware that disability does not discriminate. At any given time, you can become part of this community of people that face barriers every day in just doing things like reading a sign. So society dictates that how I'm going to navigate my life is by reading a street sign. If I don't have access to that street sign, just like someone with a disability or a first Canadian, it's not inclusive. It, it literally allow, doesn't allow me or my family, because I have two children and a husband, and we just want to go out and, and celebrate as a family. But there are so many barriers like that that are very small that just say, you don't belong here. And anybody could be that person at any given day. Here is an excerpt from the actual act, the clunky act, as uh, David Onley described it, the Accessibility the for Ontarians clunky. with Disabilities Act. Um, here's the quote. Uh, it's all about developing, implementing, and enforcing accessibility standards in order to achieve accessibility for Ontarians with disabilities with respect to goods, services, facilities, accommodation, employment, buildings, structures, and premises. And here's the kicker. On or before January 1st, 2025. So we're less than six years away from all of this. Um, David Only, in your view, how much progress has been made towards that goal as described in the Act? Um, it's almost impossible to say because there's never been a definition of what that fully accessible Ontario is. And that's one of the recommendations um, I put in the report because it was something we heard again and again from people. If you don't know what your goal is and you can't describe it, how do you know whether you've met it or not? And uh, that continues to be the biggest problem, I think. Are, are there not sort of... I don't know, Ministry of something inspectors that go around the province and can tell what progress has been made? No. Hmm. Um, and, you, I mean, you, I can describe progress. I think, I think we both can describe progress, but, it, it, but we can't, def the, we have not defined accessibility. And one of the recommendations we made to the minister was make that definition, make it as inclusive as you possibly can and involve as many different members of the disability community so that people with mobility issues like myself are included and people with vision problems are included or who are blind, um, hearing impaired, deaf, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, come up with a definition. It will be a wide net that will be cast, but um, it will let us know whether or not in less than six years we've uh, achieved the objective. Yvonne, what's one thing that the government of Ontario could do that would make your life a little more barrier-free? One thing? <laughs> yeah. I know you probably got a list of a hundred. Yeah. All right, let's start well, with one. One thing would be, I'm going to get a little personal, being able to provide an equal playing field for education for my children. What does that mean? Well, it means that the environments right now there isn't anything available for people who, people who are able to participate and there is a misunderstanding in what that participation means. So there is this, there's this sort of generalized standard for here we have our checklists, we've done what we need to do, now you should fully participate. So as a working mother who also has a disability, I am obligated to go to work and pay taxes, which I'm more than happy to do, to participate in society. 
But when a working mother has to spend the majority of her time advocating for her child, that means I'm not able to fully participate and neither is my child. Mm. That is one thing, access mm. to education in an environment that is conducive to an individual and understanding that individual's needs. David Onley, one of the deputants who made a presentation to you so that you could write your report, mm -hmm. said, we want 100% access to everything just like everyone else. And my question for you is, is that a reasonable ask? Uh, it's a reasonable ask if we can define what it is that we're talking about. And uh, because so far we haven't haven't done that, and so we have to define what the, the different limitations are and so far as mobility is concerned, and then we have to address what the, the solutions are. Now, we've all seen uh, the, as it come to curb cuts, which were a tremendous innovation, and in recent years, we've seen the metal raised bumps uh, in a bright yellow fashion, mm -hmm. which uh, enables people if they're using a cane or if they're using a scooter or a walker to sense that they're, okay, I now I'm approaching or I'm about to get into where the curb is. Hmm. And at a shopping plaza near us, near our home in Scarborough, um, there was a curb cut that they added to um, by installing uh, these tenji blocks, as they're called, or raised domes. Hmm. And uh, so that was good. Uh, so you, cross the driveway to get to the sidewalk that you would take to come from off the property into the mall, there was a curb cut there. Um, the expectation was that they would add some bumps there. Mm -hmm. Instead, they filled it in. So now somebody coming from off the property, using a mother with a buggy or a person like myself in a scooter or a wheelchair would take the sidewalk and couldn't get down. You'd have to loop your way all the way back, get off the property, and then come in on the roadway, the driveway, into the plaza. And you just go, who came up with that? Yeah. How was that done? Well, one of the things you point out in your report is that, um, well, I should ask the question, the next generation of architects coming out of our architecture schools, yes. are, are they being taught to design the facilities and the environment of the future no. with these issues in mind? Mm. No, they are no, not. not. And that's, you know, that's something directly that the provincial government can address. And uh, I don't want to be as simplistic as, say, with the stroke of a pen, but they have the authority to do it. So I don't know how you change the built environment for the future unless you set very specific standards as to what those designs must be. And um, I mean, there's some very, very talented people out there and organizations that are addressing this issue. Design Able is one of the uh, ones that comes to mind. Uh, and they can go through any set of plans and uh, provide the advice and give the instruction. But it's something that students of architecture should take into account because uh, in many instances, people with disabilities regard architects and interior designers as the enemy. The people who make my life difficult, the people who create barriers for me because I can't use this facility because of your work, mm -hmm. your design. You didn't think hard enough. You didn't do well enough. You've created a barrier that stops me from achieving whatever it is that I would like to achieve, such as literally going to a restaurant, as we talked about earlier, yeah. or to... Um, a theater or to any other place. Well, let me follow up with Yvonne on this angle. Mm -hmm. per, I mean, par, part of the difficulty, I guess, with this act is that even though it, it lays out what ought to take place over the next six years, mm -hmm. uh, th there's no penalties in this, right? So if mm -hmm. the government doesn't do it, you can't really sue them. So how do you ensure that it gets done? Well, I would say our past government failed. Our government now is failing. I have personally participated in many of these focus groups to give information. Something as simple as making sure there is a power source. Universally, this, this is where I would like to come from. Universal design means everyone. Everyone at this table right now needs to be able to plug their phone in for different reasons. If I can't plug my unit in, if I can't plug my phone in somewhere, that means 
I don't have access to navigation. I don't have access to people I'm trying to meet. I don't have access to a menu at a restaurant if I don't have a power source. That is very simple. I have seen designs prior to and asked for my input and power sources are not considered to be an accessible means of development. In fact, I think coffee shops do the opposite. They purposely don't put power <laughs> sources in there because they don't want you staying longer than the average battery life of a laptop yeah. computer, right? It's very frustrating. I, I bet it I, is. I feel sometimes that I'm, we're at a war that doesn't need to be fought. It's a but, great, great expression. <laughs> Well, David Onley does say in his report, the general view is that strong leadership must start at the top with the premier, the cabinet, and senior officials in the public service. And his number one recommendation, Yvonne, is renew government leadership in implementing the AODA. Hmm. Do you think that's possible? Do I think it's possible? Yeah. Do you think I it's think... possible to engage this government on this issue? I think anything is possible if they're willing to listen. I'd be more than happy to speak with anyone personally to help them make that happen. But right now, from what I can see, the government is failing. And I'm very concerned about this. Not just for people who are blind, although of course, that is where my heart is. But for everyone universally, if we do not make accessible environments, everyone now, you might be able-bodied, but I hate, I hate to say this in a terrifying way, that is not a forever situation. Mm. We have an aging population, we have a rise of vision loss. It is predicted that 400 million people globally are going to have sight loss. So we are looking at people who are coming to Canada, people are immigrating, and we, we're not gonna be able to provide accessibility for them. Hmm. Uh, Your Honor, have you met with the Premier about this yet? Not yet, no. Have you asked for a meeting? Not yet, but uh, the report was given to the Minister. And, uh... Is that Raymond Cho? Yes. Okay, yes. the other MPP from the City of Toronto. Yes. Doug Ford's one and Raymond Cho's the other. Uh, you gave him the report and did he undertake to do anything for you having received the report? Well, the conversation we had was a very positive one in terms of the uh, recommendations. You know, I've, I've said not just to this government, but to the previous government, that the objective here is to get as many people with disabilities who are currently on government assistance off government assistance by turning them into taxpayers. And so this is really a, is also an economics issue. And it's a, it's a matter of the betterment of the entire society. Um, the more persons with disabilities who are employed, mm -hmm. uh, the more taxpayers we're going to have out there and the more services, therefore, that can be available. Yvonne, the, the, the fact is that this government got elected and believes it has a mandate uh, to get the books back in shape. Uh, they are very fixated on reducing the size of the provincial deficit and eventually balancing the books. Mm. And they did not come into power with, say, more of a social justice uh, agenda, as you could argue the previous government did. Mm. What do you think that portends for getting some attention for these issues? Well, I think as uh, our Honorable David Only just pointed out, people like me, who were once accessing social assistance and programs who no longer need to because of technology and accessibility that is happening in different spaces. That is something that is now, as I see it, not going to happen. There's a block there. I don't think they're going to achieve by 2025 the way things are going an accessible Ontario. You, 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 you have not asked for the meeting with the Premier yet, but is that part of your plan at some point down the road? It very well could be. We'll give him a little more time. Yeah, he's been in seven months or so, seven or eight months. But he's had the report since January 31st. Right, so, mm. yeah. right, okay. So he needs a little time to digest it and then you may go after him? I would certainly be willing to talk with him if he wants to uh, hmm. hear it firsthand. Certainly. He's not he's not the only politician dealing with this right now. You know, the, no. the Senate, of course, has got a bill before it right now yes. called the Accessible Canada Act, C-81. Yes. What do you think federal officials need to know based on the Ontario experience that would make that act better? Uh, set deadlines and set parameters and be determined to meet them because uh, as... You know, as I said in the report, and which was a reflection of what people were saying to us at the hearings, I must emphasize that. Um, there were some 
rhetorical flourishes in the report, but the guts of the recommendations, every single recommendation that came forward uh, was presented at least by at least one person and usually several people at the various hearings, whether it was Thunder Bay or London or Ottawa or Toronto or Vaughan, and, um, or emails that were sent to me at the U of T. Uh, there was quite an input. And so this really does reflect um, what the people of Ontario told us. Got it. Uh, we got about a minute and a half left, and I don't want to, well, how should I put this here? We are closed captioning this conversation so that some people who have hearing issues will be able to at least see the captioning uh, on this program, and we do that for our social media clips as well. But I don't want to pat us on the back if we don't deserve it. And I want to know from the two of you, Yvonne, you go first. How easy or difficult was it for you to get into this studio today? Oh, dear. Uh, so not so great. Um, I travel in from Hamilton. Union Station is quite the nightmare. Uh, <laughs> there was only two ways to get from the platform to the subway station, and every day I must face a new construction problem. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to give it, it was very difficult to get into the station today. Uh, how about the, well, you know what? Union Station's a nightmare for, for people who've got vision as well, but uh, how about this, uh, this studio? How, how do we do here? Honestly? Yeah. Stairs outside aren't so great. <laughs> No, it's good for us to know. We need to know. So the stairs from, from outside the building mm -hmm. into the building? Yeah. Right. Not it looks so like great. a landslide. It's all the same color. Gotcha. So some yellow strips or something mm -hmm. like would be helpful. Yes. Okay, good to know. Your Honor, how about you? Um, I'm able to drive a car. I use a, a minivan to uh, lug the scooter around. And so I use the parking garage here and uh, in this building. And uh, it, it was okay. The... The gate didn't open when I pushed the button, and the gentleman told me when I pressed the button for assistance that I should push the button harder. Now, fortunately, I was able to, but there would be a whole range of people uh, with less power who wouldn't have been able to. So does that, what does that mean? Well, it means that maybe the owner-operator of this building should consider a different uh, system, a ticketing system, or... A, an entrance system. And how about getting into the studio in terms of width of doors for your scooter and so on? That was fine. That was fine? Yeah, and a ramp up onto the A ramp the onto, set. The set. onto the we set. We did have here. a ramp to get you onto the set. Yes. And, that's, and it was okay? Yes, it was. It was navigable? Yes, it was. Okay. Certainly. Good to know. The yellow strips, though, Yvonne, that's a yeah. good piece of advice. We'll take that to the folks who own this building. Great. I want to thank both of you for coming into TVO tonight uh, and um, accepting the challenge of getting into this place. Uh, to have this conversation. David Onley and Yvonne Felix, great to have both of you back here at TVO. Likewise. Thank you, Thank you so much, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.